Good day, I'm Simon Tay, the Executive Director of Professional Practices and Technical Division of the Malaysian Institute of Accountants. We are delighted to have with us uh, Ravi Navaratnam, who is the Chairman of the Ethics Standards Board, who will be discussing with us on the rewritten ethics code by the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. So, good day to you, uh, Ravi. Thanks, Thanks for coming to our studio. Thank you, my pleasure. Right, so what is about this new rewritten code by the International Ethics Standards Board? It's not an entirely new concept. It's mm -hmm. really a rewrite of the existing code, but done in a very much more user-friendly basis. I think the idea is to improve the navigation process and to provide more descriptive and analysis of particular aspects of ethics, which is so important to the accountancy profession. Um, so in that respect, the use, it's more user-friendly, as I said. The navigation mm -hmm. process is far simpler and there's stronger prescriptive and descriptive um, analysis of the concepts such as independence. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so much more critical to the aspects of accountancy. And well as, as well as it provides some general guidance, um, mm -hmm. more specific guidance on certain practice elements which are, which are, which are required in the accountancy profession. I understand that also in terms of the professional accountants in business, there are areas such as uh, professional skepticism and judgment that is also some of the areas that are in the focus. It is. Um, you know, there are three elements within the ethics um, environment which, mm -hmm. to my mind, are very critical. That's really the question of independence, the question of professional judgment, and this whole issue of the skepticism profiling. Um, now, it's difficult to sort of imbue specific wordings for each one. So while the code is an improvement over the old one, it still doesn't reach what perfectionists would want in terms of absolute criteria for each one, mm -hmm. but much better than what it was in terms of guidance notes for um, those three elements, i.e. independence, professional judgment, and uh, skepticism. What's the plan? Uh or adapting this into, into Malaysia because we understand that in Malaysia, um, generally, the uh, auditors uh, and the professional accountants in business, MIA members basically, needs to comply with the International Ethics Code. So, so it was written last year in around uh, April yeah. 2018. And so uh, there is actually a, a, a journey into adapting it into Malaysia. So what's the progress of this? Well, there are two elements. I think the journey started way before even it was put in as an exposure draft to the Ethics Standards Board. Um, <clears throat> and in that respect, the Ethics Standards Board actually participated in the actual formulation, if you like. Perhaps mm -hmm. not all of it, but towards the tail end of it, there was a constant dialogue between mm -hmm. uh, ISBA and its member components. And in that respect, uh, the Ethics Standards Board participated in this process by sending our delegates across to the various roundtables that were held yeah. in terms of formulation. Yes. Now that it's been formulated and put into a standard code, it's now reached a stage where we've had to review it in terms of potentials for localization. Yes. And it will be, under, as I understand, uh, subject to clearance from the MIA Council, be put in as a part one of the revised MIA code. Yes. Um, now, in order to put it into as part one, there are two elements. One is the review process, by which the exposure draft is then made into the code. Uh, and then secondly, is the localization process. Now, the code is going to be fully implemented in Malaysia by the 15th of June, I believe, 19, 2019. Yes. So that's a couple of more months to go. Uh, we are going to be using this period to actually look at what the code requires, is by requirements are, how it's going to fit into the MIA code. Um, and we've taken two strands of criteria on this. Number one, that whatever is imbued within the code will at least meet the minimum standards of the ISPA requirements. And in certain yes. cases, the MIA code will require higher standards than that of the ISPA. Right. Secondly, <clears throat> there will be elements where there will be needs for localization. Now, I won't go into specific details on that, but it's inherent to say that that will be subject to the first criteria, which will be that it will be the minimum criteria. So you will have a bare minimum that yeah. uh, that is 
it's uh, in accord with the international standards and you may also, I, as I understand, make it more stringent to yeah. localize it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think there are already standards which are in place mm -hmm. in Malaysia which are of a higher standard than what mm -hmm. is being called for by ISPA. And the Ethics Standards Board in the MIA context see no reason why we should then lower the standards mm -hmm. to meet with the lower or rather minimum requirements of, of uh, ISPA. In terms of, um, you know, uh, when this code is coming out, of course, it's going to be, you know, uh, enforceable in June. So, uh, what activities do you have in plan, uh, you know, plan to, you know, to educate or to create awareness about this code? Okay, it's essentially profiling, education, and outreach, and they're all intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, most recently, I think in Late last year, we engaged with the ISBA members by getting two of their core people across to Malaysia <clears throat> and they're giving an explanation in the broadest context possible to members who attended. We had a pretty good turnout for that, but that's just the start. Mm -hmm. uh, going down, we expect to be able to uh, have increased profiling of uh, the code, uh, such, as with, such as this interview. Um, we have outreach programs, which we are hoping to conduct with uh, our members which will be explanatory as well as educational. Um, educational in terms of outreach to a wider group of people than rather just our members. It will include students, uh, academics, etc. Um, and then within the question, within the ambit of engagement for further refining the localization that we will continue to do as well. When the code came out, one of the key changes uh, was actually on the requirements for partner rotation, the long association uh, requirements on appointed dependents. And I understand that uh, the Ethics Standards Board did quite a lot of work last year, second half of last year on this. Yeah, um, I don't want to put into perspective or context that that, that is the only major change. Right. You okay. know, it is a significant change, mm -hmm. um, but it is not the only change. But I yes. think it's gathered the most attention mm -hmm. and, and due process, if you like, because of its impact on the, the partnering processes involved in the practice. Um, ethics goes far wider than that. But mm -hmm. having said that, given that uh, this was a key component of the process of change, this partner rot rotation process uh, received a lot of attention mm -hmm. and therefore required a lot more perspective and introspective uh, discussion amongst ourselves and engagement with our member components, our yeah. partner members. Um, but we've gone through that. Uh, it's still a bit of a hot potato if you if you go into mm -hmm. the depths of it. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is, and that's what mm -hmm. the global environment is going for. And um, we see no reason why we shouldn't either. And the ethics center board also issued out uh, FAQs. Oh yeah, no, I mean. Yeah. The dialogue and the engagement was yes. there. We wouldn't right. simply put it in place without engagement with mm. our partner components. Right. Um, useful feedback, and mm -hmm. I think we've settled in on a ground where everybody is, is catered for as much as possible. Do you have any final words for, you know, for the members? The profession as a whole and ethics is so intertwined that you cannot separate the two. They are, they are one and the same as far as I'm concerned. But ethics is not something that is prescriptive. You don't get it on a line-by-line -line basis. At the end of the day, it's your judgment call. And how you exercise that is a function of your upbringing, your education system, your value system. I think we as Malaysians have a strong grounding in the ability to have a strong sense of ethics in our, in our culture and in our professional lives. And I urge every professional accountant and every accountant for pending or, or, or you know, accountant designate, if you like, uh, to be aware of just how strong ethics is required in your professional capacity. Great. Thank you very much, Ravi, for, for Thank you. coming to our studio this Excellent. morning.